speaking of being younger, so when I was younger, I had such a fascination with heroes. Um, when I was really, really, really young, I watched uh, The Lone Ranger. I remember having a cowboy hat, a pair of cowboy boots, and six shooters, you know, and I was, right? Uh, some of my favorite heroes were King Arthur and the Knights of the Round Table with the swords and the shields and, and the, the whole fascination of being a knight, right? Uh, shining armor, right? Um, I used to, used to have all those sticks and go around, you know, sword fighting dragons and, and other kids and everything else, right? Uh, I love the idea of chivalry. I love the idea of honor uh, and the sacrifice and the risk these heroes took. Uh, it didn't hurt that they usually rode away with a damsel in distress. Of course, she was no longer in distress, right, because you saved her. But um, I remember watching John Wayne in Iwo Jima. Right? And in my backyard, I was right there climbing Mount Suribachi all the way to the top and raising that flag. Um, I always wanted to be that hero, that white knight, right, that, that rode in and saved the day with a shining armor, uh, battling the enemy, fighting, fighting for all those people that needed to be saved. I guess that's probably why I ended up joining the Marines. Um, to me, they were the closest thing to being a modern-day knight. Uh, from their motto, Semper Fidelis, always faithful, um, to some of the sayings that they have, like um, God, Country, Corps. Uh, they also, they also uh, had, a, had a motto, once a Marine, always a Marine. So those are things that, that, that drove that, that knighthood home to me. Uh, honor, courage, dedication, those are things that they taught. And again, the closest thing to a modern day knight. And so they trained me for combat. The training wasn't easy. They prepared me for war. And while I never had the opportunity, thank God, to put that training to the test, I, I, mean, I, I never had to shoot anybody or fire my rifle in combat, but I quickly learned that warfare is far more dirty and deadlier than it was in my backyard. My time in the Marines taught me that my armor wasn't always shiny, and that not everyone made it back from those battles. There are casualties in warfare. People get hurt, and people die. And we had a saying, though, when we trained, and it was, the more you sweat in training, the less you bleed in combat. Preparing for war, training for combat, having the right equipment, understanding the mission, Having the intel on your enemy so that you can counter their attacks, it's so essential to have those things to be successful for every mission and every battle that you face. And so I'm no longer a Marine. I'm, I'm, I'm way too old. You know, it's funny, is, is right after 9-11, I, I, I tried to, to sign back up. And they're, they're like, well, you're already a disabled vet, and you're... 30-something years old, so we'll pass. We're not that desperate yet. <sighs> a blow to my pride. <laughs> so anyways, uh, I'm no longer in the Marines, and you have may, may have never been in the military, but you are in the midst of a war. You're in the midst of a battle. A deadly battle is being waged all around you, and some of you aren't ready or able to deal with what you face every day. I just want to check here real quick. Does anybody know what I'm talking about if I say an evil day? <laughs> one hand, one hand. So, so he's the only one that's had a bad day before, right? Oh, I see a, a, a two more hands. I mean, a bad day. I mean, days where everything Everything, everything goes wrong. Nothing goes right. Not a thing works out in your favor. I thought that was every Monday. Every Monday, right? As a matter of fact, if something could make your day worse, it happened, right? It's like you won the lottery that day except in reverse. Your numbers come up. And all that you won was a no good, terrible, rotten, 
horrible day. The only thing you want is pain and misery. You've had days like that? I'm sure. You're under assault. Your life is being shattered. Your dreams, your finances, your health, your stability, it's all under attack. It's an evil day. For some, it might be the stress of your job. It could be an overwhelming sense of fear and anxiety. God knows how much fear is being pumped into us every day, every time we turn on the news. The Apostle Paul calls these days the evil day because he personally experienced these evil days multiple times and he knows about the tactics of the devil and what we're up against. Paul is talking about those special days when you are under major attack to the point where you're overwhelmed, where you've reached your breaking point. Those days when it seems like all hell has broken loose and your name has come up. Hell is just coming after you. And it's those days when you just sit there and you shake your head. Why? <laughs> Paul called those days the evil day. And when those days come, and yes, I said when, not if, but maybe some of you haven't experienced those evil days yet, but just wait, they're coming. See, in Ephesians 6.13, the Apostle Paul tells us to be ready for these days, and he tells us to armor up. He says, put on the armor of God. Get ready for a really, really bad day. While we don't face much physical danger, usually in this evil day that he's talking about, we face just as much danger spiritually as if we were in a physical war for survival. Ephesians 6.12, For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. It's spiritual warfare. Now, if Andy was here, Andy would tell you that wrestling is up close and personal. And he's a wrestling coach. And Paul uses this, we do not wrestle, as a great analogy. Because wrestling, it's hand-to-hand -hand combat. It's up close and personal. It's down and dirty. You're right in your opponent's face. When you're wrestling in combat, your opponent is so close that you can smell what they had for lunch. And you can smell if they didn't take a shower in the last few days. That's how up close it is. He uses this wrestling to drive the point home that spiritual warfare is an up close and personal battle that we all face. He lets us know that it's not a physical battle, but a spiritual one. It's important to remember that everything that we face visibly and physically is preceded by which is invisible and spiritual. They come first. Our battle we face, as Paul said, is against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Everything we face visibly and physically is preceded by that which is invisible and spiritual. But we have a tendency to act like a two-year-old when they hide under a blanket and think that nobody can see them because they can't see anybody else. Anybody had grandkids do that or little kids do that, right? Just because we cannot see the spiritual realm doesn't mean it doesn't exist. It doesn't mean that these battles aren't there. Keith Green, a Christian songwriter, said, I, Satan, used to have to sneak around, but now they just open their doors. No one's looking for my tricks because no one believes in me anymore. If we choose to ignore or not believe in the spiritual realm, we will find ourselves confused, frustrated, and quenching the peace of God that he has promised to each and every one of us. As Christians, every day we are in a spiritual battle. 
Look at all the Psalms that King David wrote. Um, King David wrote, wrote his famous, uh, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, because the Lord my God is with me. He wrote that when he was under spiritual attack. If you read the Psalms, all the Psalms that David wrote, you would almost think that David was bipolar. Because one minute, when you're reading the Psalms, he is, uh, he's saying, God, where are you? Rescue me, God. Help me. The next minute, he's going, God, I praise you for you've delivered me. They're back and forth. All the Psalms, they're basically what you're reading are details of the spiritual battle that he faced. Yes, there's physical moments tied to those. There's physical moments tied to those attacks and those events. But they were all preceded by spiritual events. Everything we face visibly and physically is preceded by that which is invisible and spiritual. In warfare, battles are fought on different forms, different reasons, and with varying degrees of intensity. The same is in spiritual warfare. It's the exact same. Our spiritual battles in warfare are real, even though we cannot physically see the attacker. In John 8.44, this is how Jesus describes our attacker, Satan. He says, you are, your, you are of your father the devil, and you will do your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning, and he does not stand in the truth, because there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks out his own character, for he is a liar and the father of lies. In Revelations, he's described as the great deceiver. And in Isaiah, his prideful goal of taking the heavenly throne from God and putting himself on it is made perfectly clear. Three times in the Bible, Satan is described as the prince of this world. First John warns us that the whole world lies in the power of the evil one and that it's under the sway of the wicked one. Satan loves to divide. Some Bible scholars believe that he took a third of the heavens of angels with him when he revolted in pride against God, when he rebelled against God. Look how Satan's lies are dividing our country right now. In the New Testament, you will find about the division in the church. Satan caused so much division in the early churches. He caused division in churches today all the time. From Ananias and Sapphira to those who were so stuck on legalism that they would uh, only accept the circumcised and they forced the rules of what you should eat and what you can't eat. He, he attacked the people that said, I follow Paul or I follow Apollos instead of just following Christ. He creates so much division. There's evidence around us that Satan loves to hinder, delay, and frustrate our daily lives. This roaring lion that roams the earth seeking whom he can devour and attack. Those fiery darts in Ephesians 6.6 6 of the wicked ones are used to deceive us, to divide us, and to destroy us. Satan loves to come into churches and divide them using all his tricks. Lies, pride, deceit, gossip, murmuring. He's giving strength to false credence and those wagging tongues that are caused division. God wants us to be prepared for all of these daily battles that we face. He wants us to be trained. He wants us to be equipped and educated on how to fight these battles. To fight these battles because they impact our daily lives. Remember, the more you sweat in training, the less you bleed in combat. Life is not always easy. It's not always fun. There's hard times. We can't always live like we're playing in my backyard with, with a stick, right? Just chasing those imaginary dragons around. I would love it if we could just live life as it's a playground. But the reality is that as Christians, our life is a battlefield. Sadly, there are many Christians who end up casualties in this war because they're not equipped or prepared to be on that battlefield. A battlefield where ground is taken and lost, 
We win some battles, we lose some in those daily fights. But only through Christ will we ultimately have victory. Only through Christ will we ultimately win the war. The great thing about being a Christian is that we're not fighting for victory. We're fighting from victory because Christ has already won. He's already won the war. For those who repented from their sins and believe in our Lord Jesus Christ, they have been assured of eternal victory through the blood of Jesus Christ. Now, when I used to hear that, I used to kind of do an eye roll because I knew ultimately God does win the war, but for some reason, I never felt like what I was dealing with what I was going through, the struggles that I faced, I never felt like, okay, God, you, you win the war, but what about right now? Right now, I'm going through it. Why, why am I not feeling like you're there with me? Right? Why do I feel like I'm, I'm alone in this? 1 Peter 5.8 says, Be sober-minded, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. I often felt like I'd been devoured, or at the very least, chewed up and spit out. But that was, because I've told you this before, I'm a slow learner, right? It takes a while for things to sink in. I never prepared myself for those really evil days. I wasn't dressed properly. Have any of you ever been underdressed for an occasion? You ever been underdressed for an occasion? Uh, maybe, maybe when it's too cold outside, oh, I should have worn a jacket, or it's rainy, should have had an umbrella or something, right? Or may, may, maybe you went somewhere and everybody else was all fancied up and you weren't. He says to take up on the full armor of God. He tells us, don't go into battle not properly dressed. I've got a confession to make. When I had COVID and I was home, sick with COVID, um, I had the opportunity to work from home. I still, still do that on occasion. And so when I was at home working, I, I really didn't have a whole lot of energy, right? But I would put on a, a nice, appropriate work attire shirt, and I would attend my, my meetings online wearing this nice, appropriate work attire shirt and my pajamas on the bottom. I, I would do that more than a few times. Now, luckily, nobody but my family saw that. It was quite a sight to see. Um, but when we're in the midst of that evil day, battling just to make it through the attacks that we're under, God's telling us, take on the full armor of God. Don't be underdressed. God wants us to approach this battle the right way, and he wants us dressed for the occasion. If we want to have victory in our daily lives, if we want to have the peace, the comfort, the strength in our lives that only Christ can provide, we should never be underdressed. In Ephesians, Paul tells us to armor up. Everything we face visibly and physically is preceded by that which is invisible and spiritual. So God, through Paul, wants to show us what to do on those evil days. He wants us... He wants to give us a major tool to prepare us for those times. And again, I'm going to say it again, the more you sweat in training, the less you bleed in combat. Paul wants us to be equipped and ready to handle the evil day because our normal way of dealing with things, our fleshly way of dealing with things, it's not good enough. It's not going to help in this spiritual. Our normal way of dealing with things won't work on that evil day. Playing at church doesn't work on that evil day. And it doesn't work, period. But on that evil day, you're going to find out really how bad it doesn't work. Too many of us act like saints on Sunday, but live like the rest of the world Monday through Saturday. It's a battle cry. It's a warning call. Take 
Your walk with Christ. Take your relationship with Christ 100% serious. Be ready. Armor up. Mark 4, 17, but since they have no root, they last only a short time. When trouble or persecution comes because of the word, they quickly fall away. It's a fair bet that if you're not armored up and that evil day comes around, you might be one that falls away. You might be the one that compromises your principles, that chooses the things that this world offers instead of relying on and trusting in God. You might be the one that tries to rely on your own strength, your own wisdom, your own abilities to see you through that evil day. And then you might end up falling away. You might not be the one that falls away, but by your example, by the choices you make, the very example you set could cause someone else to fall away. Or, because the example you set, they may never even know Christ. They may reject him out of hand because of how you, the example that you set on an evil day. Because on that day, on those evil days, Paul knows, he knew that the only way to get through is to rely on God and his strength. He sa- tells us this in Ephesians 6.10, Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. On that day, you're going to need supernatural strength to get you through it. You're going to need supernatural strength to get you by that evil day. See, we see and we feel these physical problems, and we'll do everything we can to make our problem better in the flesh, in our physical world. But we do very little in the spiritual. The Bible says our struggle is not against flesh and blood. It's spiritual. And that, that's why Paul uses the phrase heavenly or supernatural places. If we want to properly deal with what we're feeling physically, what we're experiencing physically, what we're facing visibly and physically, we need to, we must deal with it in the invisible and spiritual first. Prayer is the breath of life. It's during those times that you have to view things and deal with them from the right location. And that's the heavenly places or spiritual realm. It's a well-known fact that there is a battlefield advantage in the physical realm when you have the high ground. If you have the high ground, you have an advantage but even more so in the spiritual realm. And that's why God wants us to be ready for the evil day. Now, this is a famous meme. If you're a Star Wars fan, you're gonna get your own, you'll understand it a little better, okay? Uh, but it says, it's over, Satan, I have the high ground. He wants to prepare us, he wants to equip us, he wants to give us strength to face those evil days on high ground. And that's from the, from the place of victory because Christ has already won. He's already won. He won that for us on the cross, and that's the high ground that we need to stand on. That's the high ground that we fight from. That's the high ground that we need to stand on. Paul mentions our need to stand four times. Essentially, he says that the wobbly Christian, the the, the weak Christian, the one who's in and out, the one who's not serious, the one who doesn't armor up about his life. They don't armor up. They're trapped in this recycling pattern of sin and they cannot stand in this war. Ephesians 6.10, finally be strong in the Lord in the strength of his might. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day. And having done all, stand firm. Stand. Therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and as shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness 
giving by the gospel of peace, in all circumstances take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. Stand, the phrase, stand firm. It's from his stemi, when used in a military sense, has the idea of holding a critical position while under attack. Our critical position that we have to hold is the high ground. And again, that's the cross, that's Jesus Christ. We have to stand on him where he already won the victory on the cross. Stand firm, stand firm, stand firm. Don't quit, don't quit, don't quit. What a temptation it is to just give up sometimes. To throw in the towel when it feels like everything is falling apart. Collapsing right before your very eyes with what we see in the physical. People are not the source of your problem. The people with the bad attitudes, the people that are making your life miserable, with all their issues, the hate, they're not the source of your problem. They may be a tool, a conduit, but they're not the source of your problem. We wrestle not in the flesh, but in the spiritual. So Paul encouraged us not to quit, but to stand firm. And again, Stand firm, not just anywhere, but on the ground where Jesus has already been. To stand on the high ground where Jesus Christ died and suffered for you on the cross. To stand firm, not because of you, what you can do in the physical. Your strength means nothing. But to stand in him because of what he has already done for you. You have the high ground, and you have the armor that God has provided you. You have these to not only fight the battle, but to win the war. Ephesians 6.10, in conclusion, be strong in the Lord, draw your strength from Him, and be empowered through your union with Him, and in the power of His boundless might, put on the full armor of God, for His precepts are like the splendid armor of a heavily armed soldier. The definition of a precept is a guiding principle or rule that is used to control, influence, or regulate conduct. The Bible is full of great and wonderful guiding principles to help us stand firm. And one of my favorites is Psalms 91, 1 through 16. He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will abide in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say to the Lord, my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. For he will deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the deadly pestilence. He will cover you with his pinions and under his wings you will find refuge. His faithfulness is a shield and a buckler. You will not fear the terror of the night nor the arrow that flies by the day. It's under his wing. It's his faithfulness that's a shield. It's his faithfulness that's the buckler. Don't go into battle partially dressed. Armor up. Put on the whole armor of God. In conclusion, be strong in the Lord. Draw your strength from him and be empowered through your union with him. And in the power of his boundless might, put on the full armor of God. For his precepts are like the splendid armor of God of a heavily armed soldier so that you may be able to successfully stand up against all the schemes and the strategies and the deceits of the devil. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, contending only with the physical opponent, but against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly supernatural places. Therefore, Put on the complete armor of God so that you will be able to successfully resist and stand your ground in the evil day of danger. And having done everything that the crisis demands, to stand firm in your place, fully prepared, immovable, victorious, so stand firm and hold your ground. Having tightened the, band, the wide band of truth, personal integrity, moral courage around your waist, and having put on the breastplate of righteousness, an upright heart, and having strapped on your feet the gospel of peace in preparation, 
to face the enemy with firm-footed stability and the readiness produced by the good news. Above all else, lit, all, lift up the protective shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. With all prayer and petition, pray with specific requests at all times, on every occasion and in every season, in the Spirit. And with this in view, stay alert with all perseverance and petition, interceding in prayer for all God's people. That was a mouthful, but a great, a great, great word. When we come back here in August, we'll be here in August a few Sundays, um, we're going to go through each piece of the armor. We're going to go, we're going to take each piece of the armor, we're going to go in, and we'll do some more on it. Um, the belt of truth, the breastplate of righteousness, the shoes of the gospel of peace, the shield of faith, the sword of the spirit. We're going to go through each one. But I don't want any of you to be underdressed at any time. So if you can't remember to put on the belt of truth, remember to put on Christ. If you can't remember to put on the blessed breastplate of righteousness, remember to put on Christ. If you can't remember to put on the shoes of the gospel of peace, remember so that you don't slip on those evil days to put on Christ. If you can't remember to pick up the shield and the sword when you're battling an evil day, remember to put on Christ. John 16, says, I have said these things to you that in me you may have peace. In the world you'll have tribulation, but take heart, for I have overcome the world. So, Father God, we are so thankful, so blessed. You provided us with all we need to stand firm in you. Help us to trust in your strength, your word, your promises are true. You never fail us. You never leave us. You never forsake us. You are righteous. You are holy, Father God. As we face life and the attacks, the struggles, the temptations of this world, we're so thankful that we have your armor, that we can stand firm in you, in your victory that you accomplished for us on the cross. Help us each day to take up your armor, to put it on, and to keep our eyes focused on you, your words, focused on your heavenly reward, and not the earthly struggles we face. We know we'll face pain. We know we'll face hurt. We know we'll face trials. But Father God, we stand in you and your victory because nothing we face compares to your glory and your strength. What joy and peace we have in you in every circumstance that we face because of your presence. We thank you, dear Lord. We bless you. Holy name. Amen.